Palmer's Picks. This issue, Tom Palmer looks at Scott McCloud, who at the time was probably best known for Zot, uh, also for being a very thoughtful cartoonist, and well-timed column because this is gearing up promotion for Understanding Comics, which would become his biggest work. Uh, we'll start with the first book that, that they cover is Destroy. This came out in the middle of Zot's run, and it's basically a fist fight. Uh, the loudest comic book in the universe. It's an oversized comic that kind of parodies image comics, even though this is from 1986. So well ahead of its time, but already kind of thinking about comics and the fist fights in the superhero genre. You know, this would have been a contemporary of things like Watchmen and Dark Knight Returns and Rick Feech is the one. So in a way, not exactly revisionist superheroes, but definitely looking at the genre through a different lens. The 40 deuce. Nice. And it's just the wanton destruction. What happens if superheroes really fought in, in Manhattan? Like, you know, we, we don't see the ramifications of that too often in a comic. Uh, in this one, it's almost like a terrorist attack where, you know, the buildings are just being leveled as these guys duke it out. This is probably the second time we, we showed it on the program, and I'll be honest, uh, I really had no knowledge of this comic, so I'm going to have to borrow this from you after the show. Yeah, for sure. This is a really fun comic. It's probably one that's had an influence on me. I got hold of it for some reason or other at an early age. And again, like you read some of these stories, and it does change the way you look at comics. Some fun formal stuff right here. Just having the word balloon getting obscured. And that's the thing about like Zot. Like, can we move to Zot? Yeah, one last note. This is basically Superman Doomsday. Oh, cool. Where a one perspective character shows up with just this destruction on his mind. It's exactly uh, kind of the same concept. That's fun, man. I can't wait to read that. So Zot was pretty straightforward. I just have this collection. Like, I, I got into this thing of like divesting myself of uh, if I get the big collection, like, I get rid of a lot of old stuff. But. Pull up those those OGs, man. Zot one, yeah. Show show that off, actually. That's noteworthy because this one thing we've started to mention how much Eclipse Comics publishes a lot of these books that we're referencing in the '80s, especially. So this is the first issue from 1984, and it's in color. Yeah, super unusual for an indie sci-fi superhero genre comic. We're getting to the point, like, like when this thing was published, like there, were, there was already a boom of the, like, the black and whites, and there was some 80s excess, some 80s money. So that you had first comics. You had certainly every, almost everything Eclipse did was, uh, was in color. Now, the early Zots, pretty straightforward stuff. Now, when we get to like the later Zot issues, you're going to start to see him playing with the form here. And almost like working out his rubric, like working out some of his ideas about um, the things that will go into understanding comics. And, and this book here is like a, an amazing document to just like kind of absorb where uh, Scott McCloud's mind is growing. You're, you're watching this guy's mind grow in regards to the, the comics page. Like, you know, there are like these famous passages about like showing different sequences of panels and how you could still tell stories by doing that. A lot of timing things of just, you know, cause and effect. Like, I mean, this looks, I could trick you into thinking this was a page out of understanding comics. Yeah. Very forward thinking, very influential in its own right. This was a comic that appealed to a wide range of readership. Absolutely. You know, at a time whenever the direct market was very focused on young male readers, yeah. pull, pull Zot up. was one that appealed to a much broader audience. Pull out some Zot again real quick, because like one of the one of the things that uh, that McCloud brought to the game, uh, pull up one of the color gimmicks, the, that earliest one is good. Uh, one of the things that McCloud kind of brought to the game was kind of like American manga, kind of a space battleship Yamamoto kind of kind of art, or like a Macross kind of like he had manga influence. So this guy, this guy wasn't just studying, you know, American comic books. He had a he had a wide vocabulary of what he was looking at, and and he brought that energy here, man. Probably before Frank Miller really started to mess around with manga very much. I can't claim that. Probably the same time. You know, Ronin's about eighty four. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's starting to sneak in. And again, 
helps appeal to that wider audience. You know, an audience that comes to a comic book store because they like Robotech or they Speed found Racer. some kind of anime. Uh, you know, there, there wasn't a lot for them. And, and this is a book that would appeal to a lot of people. It was other than what you were seeing in most of the comics. Yep. So Scott McCloud's always interested in innovation, thinking about the mechanics of the comics. And one of the first uh, contributions he makes to this is the idea of a 24-hour comic. We have a, a special episode where we just look at some of the 24-hour comics history. So we'll have a link to that below. Uh, but people all, I think at this point, if you're watching this show, are probably familiar with 24-hour comics. And we'll do a deeper dive in that episode. But this is a contribution of Scott McCloud's. Again, thinking of the formal creative side of comics and, and how, different ways to approach making comics. So the reason we all know Scott McCloud, understanding comics. I think this is in every cartoonist's library somewhere. Like This is past everybody's radar. When you were a kid in the 90s endeavoring to grow up to become a cartoonist, every professional that you talked to made you, made you grab this book. You can see this is my copy. I've had it since, you know, when it was very early in its publication run, and it's just beat. Yes. Uh, a well-worn, well-read copy. Yeah, like I think we're going to do a deep dive on the channel into understanding comics at some point. Yeah, we'll do a very quick flip through for the sake of this episode. Um, but it's just a lot of formal ideas about making comics, reading comics, the mechanics of how, how, how you read a comic and how you understand what you're seeing, how the image and text interacts. This was always one of my favorite images, man. This along with that one big... Uh, Triangle. Yeah, of course. But, you know, a lot of this, th to me, this is like, you give this to your mom or something, like, because intuitively as comic book readers and very, very long time comic book readers, he's basically articulating stuff that we already know. But for somebody who's like, interested in getting into the game and, and checking things out you put this under their nose and and uh it'll get, it's like a good cliff notes into being a good comics reader yeah a lot of a lot of innovate a lot of innovative stuff here i actually uh, gave this to my graphic design teacher whenever i was in college i didn't give it to him but i showed it to him he was a big book collector and he loved this uh he asked me to actually find him a copy of it so he could add it to his collection but yeah, interesting comics. I, you know, I, there was a lot of debate whenever this came out. A lot of, um, like in the comics journal letters pages, a lot of debate about some of the ideas and theories that Scott McCloud puts out in this book. And there should be. You know, this was one of the first books of its kind. There's no way someone's going to show up and just totally unpack comics. And I think that debate was valuable. You know, it was people really talking about these mechanics and, and things that had not been discussed much. Um, sometimes it was it was kind of a heated debate. Uh, guys that really disagreed with certain ideas. And I'm sure we disagree with some of those ideas too. But overall, a valuable book and a huge part of comics history. Yep, and as you can see, man, there's that Kitchen Sink Press logo because, once again here, man, coming soon from Tundra. Yeah, and at this point, McLeod is a 12-time Harvey and Eisner Award nominee, creator of Zot. So He's a Susan Lucci as well, man. I feel you, dude. I'm in the same boat, man. I at least won once, though. Interesting even just running through like who's giving quotes because Alan Moore, Neil Gaiman, Jim Lee, Will Eisner, Art Spiegelman. That says it all. It really does. This is his picto pyramid and the idea is that a photo would be like one side of it and the abstract representation of that would be the lettering that says face and, you know, comics functioning somewhere in between those. These are ideas that I think Chris Ware, uh, you know, explores. I don't know that... I don't know whether he's read this book, cares about this book, has thoughts on it, but he definitely has ideas about like cartooning and how that relates to visual representation of language. And then abstract symbols would be the other point on the triangle. Yeah, and then he finds great examples of, of everybody. Like, in, in, he positions them in such a... Per like, of course, you put like a Mary Fleener in the more abstract Picasso-ish plane. Yeah, I spent a lot of time looking at this, reading these examples, lots of names I had no idea. Absolutely. Had never, you know, I'm hearing about them for the first time on this page. Um, but an interesting concept. Like, I wouldn't really think of this even after reading it here for probably a decade. And this page in Understanding Comics, this, my friends, represents what the cartoonist Kayfabe channel is all about. Jack Kirby, Rob Liefeld, Chester Gold, Carl Barks, Robert Crumb, Art Spiegelman. Jules Pfeiffer. I'm always shy about saying Juice Schwartz's name because I know I'm saying it wrong. <laughs> but 
But this is our coat of arms right here, man. Another thing that uh, Understanding Comics was really good for was showcasing the the kind of abstract comic book work of uh, Matt Fiesel, man. Yeah, whenever I started going to... When I started making comics and going to small press shows, everybody would make mini comics, and he was kind of the guy. He would do uh, a strip called Cynical Man. Yes. was was one that I knew him you know, from reading mini comic reviews. <laughs> you see a lot of those. But uh, he was part of, of Zot. So this is a backup strip that ran in, I don't know how many issues. I think it started around issue 10 or so and would run like in every issue. And he did stick figures, which did not sacrifice any of the storytelling. So if you're coming, as I was, from image comics background and thinking of over-rendering, seeing storytelling with stick figures was very eye-opening. The, the strip that they use in understanding comics that Matt Fiesel did is fantastic. Like, you could just put the image up or whatever, but, like, it's like this perpetual motion comic strip where the guy's fishing for, for dollars, and then in the last panel, the dollar gets taken, but it still somehow cycles back to the first panel. It's amazing cartooning. Yeah, really interesting cartoonist. And it, and it shines a light on the fact that... Um, Comics are communication, and comics are ideas. It's not, like, the superficial drawing part is just, like, it's like a nut or a bolt on the bigger machine. Before we dip out of Scott McCloud, though, we should talk about that creator's Bill of Rights. Another innovation of Scott McCloud is, I didn't realize it, but he's the author of the creator's Bill of Rights. I thought this was done by a committee of, of guys like Rick Veach and Steve Bissett and Kevin Eastman, and I think those guys were all supportive of it, but apparently this is Scott McCloud's vision. And uh, I guess we should read these? Yeah, there's just 12 sentences. So creator's bill of rights, the right to full ownership of what we fully create, the right to full control over the creative execution of that which we fully own, the right of approval over the reproduction and format of our creative property, the right of approval over the methods by which our creative property is distributed, the right to free movement of ourselves and our creative property to and from publishers, the right to employ legal counsel in any and all business transactions, the right to offer a proposal to more than one publisher at a time, the right to prompt payment of a fair and equitable share of profits derived from all of our creative work, the right to full and accurate accounting of any and all income and disbursements relative to our work, the right to prompt and complete return of our artwork in its original condition, the right to full control over the licensing of our creative property, the right to promote, and the right of approval over any and all promotion of ourselves and our creative property. These are amazing. Like, every cartoonist should, should know these by heart, should think this way, and, you know, should, should have that self-advocacy to take these to heart and apply them to whatever we're working on. I, I live and die by it. Uh, frankly, before... Once again, just like understanding comics, where he's speaking about a lot of stuff that we intuitively already know, it's like if you have any dignity, like this should be the case, but leave it to Scott to like spell it out. I'll be honest, Ed. I have, I don't know how many cartoonists I've talked to, met with, been friends with over the years. Very few of them, I think, adhere to this Creator Bill of Rights. Almost, almost no cartoonists I know do. Um, but you know, we're all we're all adults, and you know, I'm not gonna. I'm just going to let you live your life. Like, I'm, you know, I ain't going to say anything, man. It's It surprises me. You know, whenever I read this Palmer's Picks, I, I saw he's the author of the creator, Bill of Rights. I had not read them before this time. Mm. And I like to think that I'm, you know, comics, 100% comics, and this is something that appeals to me, and it's still not something that I that I knew by heart. Right, I mean, I don't know this stuff by heart either, but I bet you read this stuff before, like in a comics journal or something. You've you've seen this stuff before, I would bet. Yeah. Well, I hope everybody takes heed to this and thinks about their work in these in these terms, because some of it is also your responsibility of how do you put that work out there. You exactly. know, it is advocating for yourself and for the hard work that you do. Yeah, and if and if we all did in this comic book game, then I wouldn't have to get my temperature up when I fight for my own dignity and put my foot down with dumb shit. <laughs> 